Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the UCSI School of Architecture and Built Environment Lecture Series. With the topic, Building Immersive Environment for Cultural Learning Using Web Browser and Virtual Reality Technology. I hope everyone is feeling great today and most importantly, staying safe and healthy. My name is Jason, an architecture degree student from UCSI University, and I will be your moderator for today. I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Mr. James Lee, a contemporary artist, curator, and researcher who co-founded Minor Init, author of the Anthology of Metaverse and founder of Black Salad. Mr. James graduated with Bachelor of Arts in Multi Design from Multimedia Design from Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology and Master of Science in 3D Animation from Dundee University. As an academician, his research focused on globalization, screen culture, and curating using new media and digital technology with a focus in contemporary art and cyber and graphic. So sit back and relax everyone. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the talk. If you have any questions, feel free to type them down in the chat box. We will attend them at the end of the sharing. Without further ado, let's welcome Mr. James. Hello, Mr. James, how are you? Hello, good, thank you. Good morning, everyone. All right, so the floor is yours now. All right, uh, so I just start today with uh, uh, sharing some of my slides, some of the work that I've done, or I'm currently doing, yeah. And uh, at the end of it, like if you guys have any questions, uh, just feel free to ask. Okay. So I'll share. Yep. Just share your screen using the screen button there. Uh, maybe Kuma, you stop sharing. Yep. <laughs> All right. Yep, you may start now. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So yeah, uh, currently I'm working on this. Uh, actually just recently got into the new media thing again. Yeah, I sort of uh, studied that in university, but then I stopped when I pursued painting, mostly of contemporary art, installation, so from the virtual, I went to the real, and then from the real, now back to the virtual. I think that was caused mostly by the pandemic. So because we, a lot of shows got canceled and stuff. And uh, so in the end, sort of uh, look into again, like 3D technology and sort of web technology, which I have to admit, I sort of uh, got detached a bit. Yeah, but now sort of getting back into it, uh, I discovered a lot of new things that relates to sort of, especially with technology, with web browsers. Yeah. So, <clears throat> which led to the new projects that uh, I'm currently doing now. Yeah. So I've always been, like my art practice has always also been about creating immersive environments, especially experimenting with the gallery model, how to display art and all this. And I think now it's translating into the work I do with new media as well. And also my research into ethnography and anthropology, which is something of a central interest to me. Yeah, How things evolve, how things began, all this is always part of my, uh, I think academic and, and artistic practice. Yeah. So I always find like to present things, I think mostly influenced by film. That's why of uh, which I see as the most immersive medium now that we have. And I think VR technology is something of an evolution of that. Yeah. Okay. So so that's why like, yeah, I got into this uh was got into sort of doing using this technology and seeing how far it can go with presenting how we can build interesting environments you know 
like what games are evolving now and also with web browsers, which now can host or you can build a 3D graphics through browsing. Yeah. So there's online games as evidence of that. And, and with that technology, I think we can, can sort of evolve into using it for immersive experience, you know, for cultural learning, and uh, which I think serves a better purpose for humanity and also like society. Yeah. So how really I began of sort of getting into this is really reflecting on the hybridity. Like the world that we live in now is really a part of two worlds. You know, we live in the virtual world and we also live in, uh, of course, the material world. Yeah. And I think one of the triggers of that really started with this image. So this is the image of an altarpiece, <clears throat> which uh, my team has also modeled for uh, my current project and the research on the Baba Nyonya. Yeah. So this is an altarpiece from a Baba Nyonya family, which was a converted altarpiece from a Taoist to a Christian. Yeah, so Taoist, Buddhist, so the Puranakans used to believe in Taoism, Buddhism, and Christian. So, and then they eventually, a lot of them converted to Christianity. So, that sort of uh, activities, you know, uh, or evolution of their religion or their spiritual beliefs or their spirituality, in fact, is reflected, I think, in, in this piece a lot and this really triggered my interest in the research that I'm currently doing now for the Puranakans, yeah, which is really studying how I think a lot of societies in Southeast Asia are also sort of influenced by many cultures and sort of the culture is really cosmopolitan and that cosmopolitanism is sort of reflected in, in sort of these items and these material objects, yeah. So this you can see, uh, obviously you can see firstly the holy family of, Jesus, of uh, Mary, Joseph and Jesus Christ. So which is, this is when the owner converted to Catholicism. Yeah, but before this, this altarpiece was a Chinese Taoist altarpiece, which was converted. So you can see the architectural features, the design features are still there. And this is sort of what triggered, uh, I think I found it very interesting and something that I, I could relate to a lot, you know, growing up in this cosmopolitan environment, you know, especially in Malaysia, Southeast Asia, where you interact with many types of cultures and people and, and you actually see as one thing, not separate things. Yeah. And that of course become obvious when I lived in like the UK or Australia, when most of the people sort of they are not as cosmopolitan as sort of, I think, people from Southeast Asia. And the fact that uh, they only speak one language, yeah, although there's also sort of, there's a multiculturalism, but sort of different, I think, yeah, where there's uh, uh, something that I think people find hard to adapt to because we speak many languages as well, and that also affects our cognitive function, yeah. So this started from here, sort of reflecting from hybridity and then sort of moved on into different things, which sort of evolved my current research practice or practice in general. Yeah. So really it's about sort of how I reflect on hybridity is through metaphysics, you know, which is a, a branch of philosophy, you know, that that looks at the beginning of things, the, the how things are and be, you know, is basically looking at the uh, theory of everything, how things evolve as well. Yeah. Also the internet, and then it led to post digital cultures, something which I have discovered recently, and which is something that explains our activities on the internet, you know, and, and also uh, our activities sort of using digital technologies, you know. So digital art, virtual reality, all those goes under that and how we use it. You know, how uh, a lot of other cultures, like subcultures, music, you know, especially the music industry, uh, underground music industry as well, use that a lot. And also the game world, which is like uh, the metaverses, the simulation worlds, 
where people go in and socialize, you know, beyond social media, you know, like The Sims, you know, game worlds like that. And uh, which then also sort of, I can relate to the Pranakan, the Baba Nyonya, which I see as a starting point of this sort of cosmopolitan living. Yeah, they actually are very globalized people, people before their time. And because I think that also relates to people who live in the ports around the world. Yeah. Like in uh, also like in Constantinople, you know, and then and, and Singapore as well, yeah. Uh, the port cities around the world, uh, basically. All right, which sort of created this sort of cosmopolitanism and sort of this idea of uh, a mixed culture, which I think what is the Puranakans and which is also reflected in how we live our lives today. You know, we are all sort of Puranakans. That's how I see it now, to me, because we, we all have sort of traits that we appropriate from other cultures that we use it as our own. Yeah, and sort of, but we still sort of uh, are very ethnically conscious in that we know that, okay, I'm, I think in general, like people like, oh, they will still know that, oh, I'm Chinese, but then, you know, I'll be speaking English, I won't be speaking Chinese. Yeah, and also you can see how people use words, English words in their everyday speech, you know, especially like in the Malay or the Indian in Malaysia, which is sort of reflective of that. Yeah. And that I also saw that in also that house relate to also the digital cultures, the post digital cultures. And because of that, also we see in our modern world that that is sort of the hybridity that we live in today. We, we don't have certain one way to do something. We have many ways because of the technology. And that creates that plurality. And sort of from that as well, uh, it sort of relates to digital art in the sense that. Uh, now sort of i think with technology it provides a lot of options for how anthropology or archaeology can work you know how you can preserve cultures and should does not need to be physical but how we record things now uh, and how we present data can be done in a more artful way because of digital technologies you know like virtual reality 3d models 3d modelings for environments or even uh, 3D scanning for archaeological sites. And a lot, I think, the beauty about that is that we can now imagine better because we can visualize these situations through these simulations. Yeah, and that presents a different reality as well. And, and so I come to the concept of rabbit holes, <laughs> which also reflects hybridity because I think that's how we discover things. That's how we also start to uh, get influenced by, I think, sources from the internet. If we sort of, uh, that reflects our society today. Yeah. So this is sort of the topics that help me to think about hybridity. Yeah. Which now I translate to mostly work that I do for the Puranakans and the digital art. Yeah. All right. So, So that also helped me to start to develop a sort of way to visualize fluid amalgamation. That's what I call it a concept of my own is, which is when you, how do you visualize fluid processes, you know? And, and I think that the influence from technology and looking at the sort of website as an architectural space and also extended reality technologies sort of help to express that. Yeah. So it's really true asking these questions, you know, mainly why do I use these technologies really? Because how do you make virtual experiences on the browser more human? Which is actually a, a question related to post-digital cultures, which is how do we make technology more human? That's the central question. And also, how do we create uh, authentic experiences for creating culture and heritage for cultural learning? Yeah. So that that is sort of a, uh, also under the canon of post-digital culture because I think in the UK and the US, uh, museums are already uh, investing heavily into this. 
you know, and also uh, a lot of architectural sites like uh, like on Google. Google has been investing a lot into mapping or 3D scanning cultural sites, buildings and stuff, which you can find on the website, uh, like Open3D, you know, where they share data on this stuff. And uh, sort of also on the website, like Google Arts and Culture, where you can find a lot of uh, whole buildings which are scanned in 3 which are modeled in 3D. And you can sort of uh, look at the whole building from the tip of your finger just by scrolling around. Yeah. So that's really interesting in that you can do that now. And that sort of creates a very fluid experience. You know, you don't need to, to and especially now with, with the lockdowns and the pandemic, it, it, you don't need to sort of buy a ticket. You don't need to take a flight, which is actually, if you look at it, the cost, I mean, everything is quite tedious, but of course, it's, it's still the experience of traveling. But you can sort of experience it first before you commit to such an endeavor and stuff, you know, which creates also a different sort of experience of how you can experience cultural heritage. Yeah. So through these sort of essential questions and, and from there really I think a lot of how I think a lot of how I think about sort of immersive spaces comes from uh, film, you know, especially the use of images and sound. Yeah, I think that that is the factor that creates an immersive space and creates allows uh, viewers to escape into that world. So it becomes sort of like a rabbit hole trigger, you know. And then this is actually not new technology because indigenous peoples from Australia has been using it uh, ever since. And that could be, you know, 30,000 years, 40,000 years ago since people were painting in caves and where they create these rituals and ceremonies to perform their stories, you know, by combining music with the, the visual. Yeah, and this is sort of something primordial, which is still existing. It's just how we sort of, but the technology has changed. Now we experience this through the screen. Yeah, so that's why screen culture is also one thing that uh, is part of this, the study, you know, that's how it relates to internet and also films and how we also engage with our contents on laptops and on uh, mobile. Yeah. So everything we build nowadays, when you think about these two questions here, it, you have to think about how someone experienced these environments on different formats or screens. Because your phone has a different format, uh, your laptop has a different format, your TV might also have a different format. Yeah, so it, it all comes to, and also within your phone, there's different formats. If you are experiencing something on say social media like like uh, Instagram, it's a square format as well, you know? So what we build now is really, you have to think about it, that you can, your content has to fluidly move into different platforms and, and be able to still hold, sort of hold that sort of experience there, yeah? So, so from that, uh, so it's, so from that, we also discovered sort of the technological WebGL, <clears throat> which is short for Web Graphics Library. Yeah, so it's a JavaScript API for rendering 2D and 3D graphics on any compatible web browser without use of plugins. So this was for me a big discovery because now you don't need to, to, for people to download anything. You know, they can watch straight away or they can experience uh, virtual environments straight on the browser. So that is very accessible. It creates a sort of different uh, uh, dimension already because now people can even experience that on their phones. You know, very high-tech 3D rendered graphics as well can be experienced on the phone. And that's why game, the game industry exploded because of this. You know, and, and a lot of like, the cultural heritage and people to in, in digital cultural preservation are looking into these technologies as well, besides sort of VR, which is sort of been around since the 90s. Yeah, and now it's sort of, I think in the last 10 years, it, it made a comeback again because of, I think also the advent, because mobiles can now sort of uh, are 
the the mobiles we have now, the phones, the smartphones, we have, devices we have now can also uh, accommodate VR technology and experiences. Yeah. So really, all the technology out there is is really very powerful now, and it's really up to the creativity that we have, like how we want to use it, you know. And how we experience things is really something that is primordial already. Something that we already experiences with film, and from before on that, uh, <clears throat> you know how we experience art as well, which is still the same. It's just how the message is sort of. I think going back to Marshall McLuhan is you know the medium is the message. Yeah. So how how is the story being told through these new mediums? I think that is the key. Yeah. So. Uh James, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you make the screen uh, full? Uh, because I think we 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 are enjoying your talk. Okay. And I just just to to make okay. it. Uh, uh, How to make it full? Eh? Um, sorry. Uh, maybe you find the view there. There's a view on top left. Um, top left, at the left. View. I Keynote. No, no, no. The view. Is it that one? The view on Zoom or what? No, no, no. On here. On the on the presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then you can make it full screen. Is it too small? Okay. But then I can you still see? I can't share it. Uh, if it's full screen, I can't share. Is it uh right now it's still sharing? It's still sharing, huh? Okay. Just uh I, I think it's okay. La. It's okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then also I discovered game engines, which I also then discovered is used a lot in architecture as well for building environments now. <laughs> A lot of developers use it. Also, uh, a lot of my architectural friends, which are also artists, are using it for creating worlds. You know, which, which is a practice uh, that you know a lot of, I think, a lot of architectural students do in their studies. Yeah. So virtual worlds are a sort of thing as well. Yeah. And this sort of idea began, I think, when basically, yeah. Uh, the discovery of the internet and also the discovery of games, game power engines, you know, from PS, PS PlayStation to now, which is some, somewhat of the norm. But the, the, I think what is really interesting now is that game engines are free to use and it's really easy to use. You don't need to really understand coding and all this stuff anymore to do, to create a game even. Yeah, but game engines go beyond that. It, yeah, I think it it provides a platform for animators as well to create immersive environments, and also for anyone who wants to create a world of their own. You know, to do that, and these things are also can be uh, also can be done online as well nowadays. You know, you have Mozilla's uh, like Mozilla has has its own sort of uh, virtual world builders. You know, you have VR chat and things like that, which are virtual worlds built by people and online and they are socialized. Yeah, so people actually build their own worlds, have fashion shows, parties online, and they do that, you know, even before the pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, so that's sort of an architectural practice as well, I think, to see it. In a sort of way, it's when you build a world, it's sort of doing that, yeah. And it's also also combining sort of ideas from film and stuff, so and creative immersive environments, so that you create an environment where social activities can happen, but virtually, yeah. And and that is all because of game engines now, the technology of the internet, browser technology, you know, which allows that to happen, and everything is free now. You can go and build your own world and invite your friends there and you can party and you can talk, you can <laughs> uh, date and all these things. Yeah, so that's a separate world as well. But it's just to highlight the fact that, you know, that the technology is, is all there now, you know, to be discovered and to be used as well. You know, you don't really need to be an expert in 3D design and all these, you know, 
where it's everything you can be built in plugin. Also used in education a lot now, where you know teachers can create games and all this stuff. So that you know to create a more, uh, I think, a more fluid environment, you know, between a classroom and also uh, the virtual learning. Yeah. Okay. So. So here are sort of examples of what I mean by extended reality, so which is basically a combination of virtual reality and augmented reality. Yeah. So, so far, I haven't experimented so much with augmented reality, which uh, I see, I think, has more function as a practical function. <laughs> you know, like, uh, you can't find a way to, to use augmented reality in, in a useful way yet. But maybe in the future or, but it works more in the sense that if you can go out in the real world, yeah, augmented reality, and then it's sort of say like, if you go to a uh, uncle Wat, so you can like me use augmented reality to tell you about the certain artifacts there. And then you don't need to be in a museum, but you can do it in a museum as well, which some museums has already implemented this, you know, and it could be used to conservation, con, uh, conservation for architectural sites and things like that around the city, which uh, I think there's a projects that are ongoing also in Google, also in the new city of New York, uh, but it's not really implemented yet. Yeah, but I think in the future, very soon, most of the cities in the world will be using that as well. Yeah, and then yeah, virtual reality, which is I think can be mobile now. So you can buy a, a headset and then walk around the city as well, and you can create virtual environments. But uh, or experience virtual environments. But I mean, <clears throat> that is sort of dangerous in a sense. <laughs> but I think virtual reality could be the next step into how you experience sort of what you experience with film now. Yeah, and I think all of it like extended reality is a mixture of both. You know, which is a term used to explain both technologies, yeah, which are now widely extensively used in the museum curation and also uh, the preservation of uh, heritage sites, architectural sites, you know, and such. Yeah, so you can see that uh, in evidence in the Google Arts and Culture site, you know, or there's a project called. Uh, open 3D by SciArc. Yeah. So they are doing collection of data on, on uh, virtual sites and the same thing which contributes on Google. Actually, you can see, I don't know if you can see this. So they, they <laughs> maybe I can show it. Can share with you guys with me. So this is a website. So they did mappings of uh, architectural sites here. So you can really study them. That's not much from Malaysia yet. I think uh, they never, you need a 3D scanner to do this because you need, or you need to take pictures of the, the building and then uh, you map it on a 3D surface. That's why they get these uh, renders, yeah. But you can see from any angle of the building and really study it, which I think is a great tool, you know, which is something I'm trying to emulate as well on uh, with my project, Living Together, which is uh, part of the Puranakan project. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if you guys have time, you can go check out the site, it's pretty fun. You can, <laughs> if you like details and such. 
So you can also view it on your phone. I think it's, it's a better experience on the phone because uh, the images appear larger. Okay. So, so going back to that, so now I want to move on to a sort of building virtual worlds. Yeah. So it's mainly, uh, I want, I'll use the examples of what I've been doing now, which is one living together, which is the, uh, the Puranakan project and anthology of metaverses, which is the, the project I'm doing with digital art. Yeah, curating art digitally. So, so I'll rather share the whole thing. Okay, so this is still a, I think, ongoing project. So it's still in, in the process. Yeah. So thinking about also fluidity experiences, the two central questions yeah, that's really played out here. So this is the website that we developed for that. So this is WebGL, it's what we use. Right now, I'm still not really satisfied with the results. I think it's... Uh, It can be better, yeah. But you can see the technology now. You can create quite realistic 3D renders on web. Yeah, you can have reflections, you know, uh, environments, of course. So it's really stitched together by by a picture in the back. It's really by picture, but these are 3D elements which you need to be in a GLTF format or GLB format then you can put it in and you need someone who knows a bit of coding and to work with WebGL in order to build these things. Yeah, but you can build it on 3D and then transfer it. You can ask sort of a web developer to help you do that. So if you want to create environments where people can go in straight on the browser, that's really useful. Yeah. So this is uh, what what is this for is really for the navigation of the website. So it's sort of like a loading base. This is a navigation bar, which I use different things that we model. You know, now this is just a test uh, of how it could work. So when you click on any one of these, it goes to a page on the website. Okay. So it goes to the page, yeah. So we're still working on the overall design. Some parts I think are not uh, are not relevant, like you know. So it's still it will be evolving, yeah. This. So so far we've developed this as well, which is uh, our to display our three artifacts. Yeah. So it's really something similar to what uh, Google has, you know, where, you know, we can use. And then, you know, with the artifacts that we are modeling and also scanning, you know, we, we are collecting sort of artifacts from people, which they let us sort of digitize in a way to conserve it for them. Yeah. So this will be good as well for, I think mostly I'm building this site is really because I want to do the research and we can't really go anywhere now, but also during, you know, in your life, you won't be able to travel so much because you have work or you have classes or whatever. And this is the sort of, I think, an alternative way to, to study about artifacts. Of course, it's nothing will replace touching the real thing, but you know, but it still helps you in your how you can conceptualize and think about uh, what you are researching on, especially with objects. Yeah. 
and also for people who are just you know it's some, something quite interesting quite interactive as well as if because in the museum you can never touch these objects here yeah? you know you always look at it through a vitrine but but in the digital space you can actually manipulate it you can touch it so that so you can get an idea of, of how it feels yeah so this is just uh, one of it so we will all the artifacts that we create we will later upload and, and people can view it in this way yeah so with the vr we're not done yet we're building it on unity so i will later show you a fly through of that yeah but also about i know about fluid experiences uh, as well we also the site itself is also sort of built to host other mediums as well you know in, in terms of conservation like for podcasts you know interviews with interviews with uh our interviewees you know our chats with them and sort of i think to do research in a multimedia way not in a way that just you know you write a paper and stuff yeah but i think this also counts as a way to display your research to display your data which is more interactive more entertaining as well you know because not everyone i think uh, will Will want to go and read a journal you know of course academics of course will do that not yeah if you want to go deeper then yes but this serves as a good platform as well in a way to create a rabbit hole for people where they can discover something and then they can go deeper into that you know to create accessibility so we build as well pages for podcasts uh, yeah, it's nothing up yet. We are still ongoing because right now with the pandemic, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to do interviews. You know? And a lot of the Peranakans, they are quite, they are of uh, the older generation, so they are not so savvy with or keen with doing interviews uh, through Zoom and such. So that is something that we will add on later. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but in our gallery, we're still in the midst of collecting family photos. Yeah. So all our data is really stored on Google. We really depend on Google Drive a lot, you know, in order to store our artifacts. So we collected a lot of family photos. Uh, we haven't uploaded all of them yet. This is sort of an example of that. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is sort of, how also we can conserve, I think, all these material objects with digital technology. Yeah, because these photos, if you leave it, you know, they, they, they will crumble and disappear, you know, because people don't keep negatives. Uh, unfortunately, people should keep negatives instead of photographs, I think, because those last longer and you can then recreate the picture. But people only keep photos. So, this is a way I think a lot of them, you know, a lot of, I think when Peranakans, we interview them, they talk about, is really talk about things from the photos, you know, so from their photo albums, they always take out and show it to us. So, so we find that that is a quite a crucial part of their social memory or their memory of themselves as identity of how they live as well. And this is also how <clears throat> we can see uh, like the cosmopolitanism, you know the westernization how different when different times of history you know how people change as well because of that which is quite interesting you know like now i think with the political power of america you know and then china also now now we see also a different people sort of adapting differently in their different ways how they are culturally adapting as well which you can see in the Peranakans which, where you can see where they were speaking Malay before and most of them speak English and now a lot of them are changing going back to learning Chinese yeah so you can study all this as, as a way of like so the ethnographic evolution of the culture yeah so oops Sorry. So, no. so, 
So this is how we organize the project. And I really like the base of the house that we're designing now is really from a source from other research. You know, of course, uh, we have, before the pandemic, I've visited the Malacca and Baba house, also walked through Malacca and Penang Nonya house. Yeah. But there are actually a lot of uh, literature out there that you can learn from. You know, you can even get for free online. Like this is a Chiang Fat Si, which is something we base on our studies to understand what the elements that goes through building a house, which is quite a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. So all these uh, we source online and something that uh, my 3D team as well use as a reference. Yeah. And also for us as a, uh, for me, as my research on hybridity is to look at sort of, you can see in, in the facade of the house, the history of the house, you know, it, it's really is a reflection of the cosmopolitanism that I think exists in our world. Yeah. With like, you know, uh, interior features, Victorian, Scottish, and then, you know, Dutch footways, you know, the house was built in, in uh, why the long house or the shop house is built sort of architecturally, I think Dutch or Chinese, it's a mix of both actually. Yeah. And you can see this, you know, it's uh, also Javanese, Malay, Thai, depending on, on where the Peranakan end up or where they've been before and they, they sort of adopt this. So it becomes like an assemblage. The culture is like a collage, assemblage. <laughs> And I think that reflects it. It reflected through sort of the house and thing in the most obvious way. Yeah. So yeah, so to do research, we sort of also from studying all this, we created an asset list. Also the architectural styles, which is what we see as a straight baroque, we'll call it that. So what, what we see now is, is really that or you can call it Art Deco, which is a later time, 1920s, but for that, it's an art bar. I think an app term to describe the architecture is uh, Straits Baroque, which is something very, uh, I think very authentic to our region, yeah? because of the, the port cities around Penang, Singapore, Malacca, which, you know, where this architectural style sort of began but through, I think, through first the Chinese came, you know, which sort of influenced or to build brick houses, shop houses, and then European influence also came in, which created that style. Yeah. And also influences from, uh, of course, Malay roofs. Malay architecture, I think, is one of the most beautiful architecture around in the world. Which also you can see it's in uh, its influence in the house also in the way of also uh, I think the attitude mostly <laughs> yeah okay so yeah so it's good to be organized when you're doing this because you have to create a lot of assets we have asset lists to create that and uh, now I can share with you a, a walkthrough of the. Of where we are at with the house. It's not very much yet. Plus, I'm also working with volunteers. There are also students, you know, students from uh, <coughs> the ICAT faculty, 3D students, which are helping me with this. So, this is built on Unity. So, so far, we've got the tiling done. Uh, so, this is based on the Chiang Fat Si mansion. So, of course, with Chinese houses, there's always a courtyard in the middle and always an open space. Yeah, so this is where sort of guests will come and a social space where people hang out. Yeah. So these are some of the things we modeled so far. Some of the things are just placemakers like for future, we will replace it with uh, more authentic uh, artifacts. Yeah. Okay, so these are some quays and stuff like that. So uh, this we now go into the kitchen. Yeah. So all these spices are from our research that we see. 
and yeah and sort of how a kitchen is built what type of uh, kitchen utensils and tools so all this we try to replicate in the digital realm on unity but uh yeah right now i'm still not really satisfied with the results i think it will take a longer time and more help i think uh, in order to achieve also hardware plays a, a huge role into the level of, of uh, the rendering the quality yeah but also we have to think of is is because it's for the web things cannot be too heavily uh, rendered so we've used the technique of course of of, of uh, photo mapping as well you know mapping the textures or finding really good photographs and then using that like how google does it yeah so certain features has to be very accurate like the wooden the wooden ceiling so these areas are i think not yet we haven't worked on it too much yet you know because it, it really takes a lot of time to model the model the, the basic artifacts yeah because with the because it's baroque style you know that's why it's very intricate yeah so <clears throat> that's why thank god we live in a minimalist world everything is straight lines and stuff because of course it's beautiful so in order to conserve it we needed to go and in, look into the detail you know so a lot of other things we're still looking at what to conserve also uh looking for people to to donate items so we can model them or scan them you know and then we can use it and put it into the house yeah so this will be eventually be vr yeah but for now it's still under construction it's where we are at so uh if anybody wants to volunteer and try you know to help the project you know we're really looking for uh people to help you know build the environments also how to make things historically accurate you know, which is really what we're aiming to do yeah so eventually there will be people as well, but I think we won't animate the people. It will just be still models. So it works sort of like a diorama, but a, a diorama where the, you can, the viewer can experience going into it, you know, experience it as a world. So that's why sound plays a very important role in creating the reality. I think creating the texture and the life basically itself, yeah, to evoke some sort of sense of life. Okay. So, right, so now I'll show you my other project. So this is uh, so this is my anthology of metaverse project, which is the mainly focuses on digital art. So I want to catalog actually or create a catalog of digital artists around. Yeah, so these are so much artists that has been part of uh, <clears throat> our first exhibition, and we have another exhibition coming up, which is part of a residency. Yeah. Right, so it really focuses on uh, the creating a democratic space to show that the internet is a democratic space, you know, and uh, and also a different experiment with new ways of showing different types of internet arts, yeah, uh, digital art. Okay, so this is the exhibition now, which we created a world <coughs> based on the idea of the internet. Loading issue. 
Hmm. Must be the zoom. Sorry about that. Uh, do you have any photo for that? Yeah, see, maybe I should. You can check it on the website. Yeah, maybe you will share the link. Yeah. Uh, on the Zoom here, so everyone can use that. Yeah, you can visit. Can you enter? Yeah, can. It's a it's a it's a it's a hollow stuff. The checkered. Pattern. Yeah, you sort of go into a, a hole and then you end up in the space. Yeah. So that's where sort of. Uh, That is basically the exhibition. Yeah. So that's also you done with WebGL. Yeah, so you can navigate around the sort of mimics a virtual site or sort of we try to create a, a idea of a metaverse from that so you can click on the works you can go and, and it goes to, to different sites and to play the video as well because we also there's some technical stuff to do with that because uh, you can't host unless you have a server you can't host two heavy things on the website yeah so it's good to 
you need to pay for a server or you need to link up with uh, someone who has already a server in order to do that. So that's the, the thing that with high resolution images or anything like that, you will need a server to back it up. If not, the solution is you can use sites like uh, YouTube or Dailymotion, or you know you can use uh, HTC uh, Vivo, Viveport and stuff if you're doing VR and things like that. You know if you're doing 3D videos or doing VR as well. So those sites support it, uh, VR chat as well. If you want to, you want to create those environments online. Yeah. So, so now I'm working on the second part of that anthology of metaverses. It's uh, really a residency show, which uh, I'm looking at doing. Uh, sorry, Mr. James. Yeah. Um, maybe Ms. Intan will share the website just now. Okay. So okay. you can let every participant look. All right. Uh, Miss Ita. Um, yes, this one. Yeah. 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 See. Yeah. So all these are artworks uh, by the artists. So if you scroll over them, you can see their names, uh, description as well, and it will link you to the page, the artist pages. Yeah. So we try to do something different from the usual, from the usual virtual gallery. Uh, which is always about closed spaces uh, because conceptually what we're thinking about is breaking all these ideas on sort of confinement and also I think something that sort of we think about because we are in lockdown so so we decided to go with open space yeah so this is sort of a space uh, representative of a sort of a metaverse of the internet basically yeah so you can go on the works, you can click on them. Some are, there are different mediums, like this is a 3D model. Yeah, some are videos. Some are just still pictures. <clears throat> yeah. So, so at first uh, to build this, it wasn't too long, you know, because uh, it's quite simple because we didn't need, we didn't put a lot of architectural elements you know, like walls or things like that because that would make the loading even take longer. Yeah. So we're trying to avoid making it too heavy, you know, for any browser. We just want to make it more accessible. So this was the solution to that. Yeah. And <clears throat> of course, with the videos as well, you know, some play, some don't, like this uh, sort of place, some don't because they are too huge a file. So we also listed them on YouTube where you can unlist, load unlisted videos, so it still remain private. Yeah, so only people can access it through this portal. Yeah, you can use that with daily motion as well, which allows for that function. Yeah. So the colors are really reflective of, I think, <laughs> just the vapor wave uh, also, you know, to make it a bit more Southeast Asian, like the pink sky of KL. Yeah. And yeah, the checkered floor really is like basically the grid, you know, the internet grid. Yeah. So you can scroll through, you can just zoom through to the end. You can even go as far as you can. It's not infinity, oh, wow. right? So there is a place where you will fall off. <laughs> but it's quite far. Yeah. Okay, so like those works on the side there, you can see, you click, then you go to YouTube. Yeah, but you can see that the, I think what, what GL offers is really 
great experiences on the browser. Yeah. You know, like Unity as well, but it's, it's a bit different with Unity. Uh, you can go it on the web, but it feels more like a player. Yeah. But I think with WebGL is a more direct experience. Yeah. And you can see it offers more, it offers a lot of possibilities and to what you can do, you know. But as long as you understand the, <clears throat> you don't need to understand the limitations in that, you know, okay, your hardware also is a factor in the limitation. Also, the hardware of the one creating the space is also a factor. And also coding, because between, uh, between iPhone and Mac and Android, you know, there, there is sort of problems sometimes when the program tries to translate the languages, the code. Yeah. But more often than not, it works. Now, yeah. Especially if on Windows or Android, it, it, it will usually work. Uh, sometimes iPhone has a problem with loading, but, but it's sort of small bugs that you can fix pretty quickly. You know? Yeah. So if you want to create projects like this, you, you need a web developer who understands this in order to create it, then it can be done pretty quick. Like this, we done it in the, the, this building, the actual building of the, the space itself and putting all the works inside, we actually took two weeks only. Yeah, so it's pretty quick. So it's just mainly some coding things, uh, whether <clears throat> you want to create colliders or things like that, so people can walk through the work or not. You know, and those are the things. So for game environments, colliders is important so that they won't walk through the walls and things like that. That requires coding. Yeah. So of course, the more sophisticated uh, you want your environment to be, uh, you need to anticipate longer loading times. Yeah. So that's why for web, I think mostly you have to deal with low resolution images for now. You know, the, the technology is not as high as what you can do with like a Unity or Unreal Engine. And those are for real game engines, which, you know, are played on uh, consoles. Yeah. So you can also experience, uh, you know, experiment with console. So you can build things on Unity, high resolution on Unreal Engine, I think is the best for that. And it's free. Students can use it for free. They even get off a grant for that. So you can build environments and, and and create a game from that, a game that has no gameplay. Yeah. So that is something I, I sort of visualize working on, sort of call it experimental animations, which is my next project. So I've uh, got a grant for that already from Chindana. So this is also part of the Chindana grant, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll be doing a residency with, you know, putting open call and doing the residency, you know, with the uh, three artists, you know, to work on virtual reality animations. Yeah. So not creating a game, but a sort of like a film that you can walk through in yourself. You can experience it yourself. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually have other links here to can show you with uh, what um, the latest the latest project I'm working on, which is also part of the, this. So that's uh, something I'm doing with my students as well. So they built a virtual exhibition of Sylvia Ligo's works, which is a uh, really big Peranakan art, Malaysian artist, which is also Peranakan. And uh, this was done on uh, Art Steps, which is a free, a free, uh, it's a free app that you can use to build virtual exhibitions. So this is uh, what my students did, the math comm students, so they're not really 
but they you can use apps like that as well to create your virtual worlds you know like also uh, mozilla hubs i think there's a few out there i think you can check it out you can call them metaverses you know decentral land as well you can use to create uh virtual worlds from there yeah So this is yeah. so I think Malaysian internet needs to be faster as well. Having experienced all this, we actually have an, uh, not the quickest internet in the world. Did some research on that. <laughs> so this provides, I think, ready-made stuff that you can use or templated, yeah, to create it. Uh. So you can add audio. I think. I think not. Uh. It makes it heavier. So we worked with the Valai Sunni with this. They contributed the artworks for us to display. And uh, as, as she recently passed away as well, we thought it would be good since we're doing a, a project related to Baba Nunya. Yeah. So yeah, it takes time to load. The more things you put, the longer it takes time to load. So this is something that you need to consider as well. If you don't care about that, then it's good. You know, but it's all about the experience that you want to create. Yeah. So there are built-in colliders already, so you can walk through the walls. <laughs> uh, it's not all of it yet. So yeah. So here is inside it. So these are the works. So it's very basic also. But this is quite common with the virtual exhibitions you see. So what I create with the AOM is, is somewhat something more experimental. Yeah. But this allows you know, anyone to do it. You can you just need your works to show. That's all in your own imagination, and you can create spaces. You know. And this could be useful as well, you know, for I think for architectural students, if you want to show sort of how things to be displayed and such. But I don't know if you can import your own structure into it. Maybe you can, but uh, I'm not really using this so much. Yeah. It's very good, I think, as uh, but you can incorporate your own 3D elements inside like this. This is from uh, the artifacts that we created. Yeah. But this is something you have to tolerate, I think, for web you know, images, you cannot, it won't be too smooth or it will be low res. So something that uh, I think in future will be resolved as technology gets better. So this is a uh, Silvalis works. Yeah. It's quite, so it's quite simple. So there are apps out there that you can use a ready-made it's all templated. You just need to use a template. Yeah. So of course, as the lockdown is continuing, you know, this will all still be very relevant. You know, and, and I think as borders are still closed, it will still be very relevant because it provides a way for you to show things, your creations people when you cannot travel as well and also i think 
you know, it's a cost friendly way to do things. Imagine, because I do physical exhibitions as well. There's so much more things to think about logistics, uh, security, insurance, you know, who's going to be at the gallery, you know, uh, in, you know, uh, staying there to look after the things and all this stuff. So doing these exhibitions virtually is really a, a relief because you're not so stressed about all those things <laughs> and you are really more in control. I think. And that's the positives from that, you know. So it's not really to replace a physical experience, but you know, as an alternative, if there's if there's a necessity. Okay. So I'll show you the other stuff. So I'll close this first, it's quite heavy. <laughs> so these are some, some of the displays also using WebGL that I'm working on for the upcoming exhibition. Okay, so so this is a display sort of how I use digital art to curate instead of text. So this is for the artwork of one of the artists, uh, which is a coffee planet. So it's a Belgian artist, which I'm also working on. So you can see his idea is uh, for the artwork is, you know, where an artwork is a planet of its own. Yeah. So this concept, we translate it into a digital vision. Yeah. So each planet you can click and it goes to uh, the artwork itself, which is a animation. So it's, it's uh, uploaded on YouTube, it's unlisted. So the only way you can access it is through uh, our site. So he works really a lot with sound and you can see the impact of sound and vision and how sound really creates reality and actually because it, it, it creates more the emotional effect. So if you want to create immersive environments, sound is a big thing.
Yeah. So the thing, the, the issue with the thing, I think it's, it's hard to upload high quality videos. Yeah. So I think that is something that we need to understand with in terms of rendering and stuff. So the, all, all the planets are, are sort of uh, the artworks. So in this way, that's how you navigate. Now. And that's how we build this environment as well. So since this is also WebGL, that's why you sort of can have the depth, but we thought like it's no, it's no point to, to add the code to, to be able to walk through. Yeah. But uh, yeah, in itself, I think this display is a sound which is reflective of the artist's work. Okay. So this is another work. So basically using WebGL to curate. So this is a work by a local artist, Satria. He's from Sabah. So his work is about the uh, archaeology, uh, urban, uh, urban archaeology, or sort of using myth to create fiction, uh, using fiction to talk about reality. Yeah. So this is his Pusat. Cultural Satama. So it just goes into a block. That's where the, he starts to tell the story through a block. Yeah. So I'm really using the, the WebGL as a, really as a, a, a way for people to be interested and to engage with his work. Yeah. So he plans to create something quite interesting, which is something you can type in and then there's a machine that will print out the, the fabric, the textile. <clears throat> so any code that you put in or if you want uh, anything that you say will be printed out and translated into the, the code and a design on the textile. Yeah, so that hasn't been done yet because it's really complicated programming and coding required. Okay. So. okay, this is also by local artist Natasha. So we're still working on this. Uh, the, the work is based on the poet laureate. So we're using sort of 3D models as well, water and sound, as you can see, it creates that rather meditative feeling. Yeah. So her work is uh, something to do with the, uh, you can listen to the poem as well. You want to try if you can load it? Yeah, maybe I think it's better to uh, share, share the link. Yeah. I think I have too many tabs. <laughs> it's too overloaded. Yeah. <laughs> My poor computer. I'll stop sharing. Can you access?
it takes time, but haven't loaded up. Not loading yet. Yeah, these are the things. <laughs> it was working pretty well already. Uh, maybe Miss Ethan, can you open it up? Yep, all right. Okay, I'm sharing. Um, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so this is the display for Sabila Chakra. So uh, work is about this orientation. So that's why we created this site, uh, this display in this way where things are disorientated. Yeah. So it's really about how the internet affects us in this way, how social media affects us. Yeah. So this is sort of the world uh, how we want to curate the work. So you want to watch the work, which is the video work. You can just click on the, the feature wall and it will bring you to the video. But all these are clips from the video of the work. Yeah. So that's why, so just to express that, it's really, that's why we create that. So the video is quite abstract. <laughs> Okay, maybe. Yeah, you don't need to watch the, the one. Video. Yeah, I try yeah. to share another one. Yeah. It's too long. James, is that a project that this, your students done? No, it's a the artist from from uh, Indonesia. Right. Yeah. The file is quite big to be open. The which one? Natasha. Natasha one is quite interesting actually. It's interactive. 
so you can paint on the browser. Oh, this is Bunyan. This is the Bunyan work by Azarik. So it's based on P. Ramli's uh, song. So if you click on the, the model, then you go to the work, which is a short animation. Yeah. All right. Okay. Maybe I can show the last one, the yeah. Natasha, Natasha one. Yeah. Uh, let's close this one. We can close this. Yeah, so this is the work. So it's inspired by poem. Ah, I forgot. It's quite important poem, uh, poet, poet laureate from Malaysia. So yeah, this is the work and you can draw on it. Uh, and then you can save it on the PDF. So it, it is experimenting with the this interactive painting, and it's sort of uh, work to distress or for meditation. <laughs> you know, while listening to the the poem on the background. Yeah. So it's just the poem playing in the back is by that. Uh, Dato Dr. Zurina Hassan. Yeah, is 1971. So this is the poem that inspires the work. And I think this is an experience of that, you know, as an artist. And sort of, these paintings will, you know, so the work works interactively. So people will paint and then uh, they can save these works for themselves and then we will also display it as part of the artwork. So the artwork really is about interaction, about so socializing online as a meditative activity. So it, it has many layers and meanings which I find very interesting. Yeah. And also it, it shows the what you can do with browser technology. Yeah. So if you want to save it, you can uh, can click there and you can save it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think in yeah. general, it's a very interesting sharing. Yeah. <laughs> like okay. a very interesting artwork that you showed to us. Thank you. So uh, yeah, so I think it's come to the end of the talk. Right, uh, Jason. Right. So thank you so much, Mr. James. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it and gave many insights. Yeah. And before we go to Q and A sessions, uh, to fill up the feedback form, I have sent in the chat box. And if you have any questions, feel free to type them down in the chat box.
And meanwhile, I have a question for you. Uh, what is the software uh, you use to do the modeling animations uh, other than using the WebGL? Uh, and Unity. Unity. And yeah, some of my team, they mostly use Maya. But you can use Blender, you can use Unity itself, you can model. Uh, uh, if you want really nice stuff, I think you have to use Unreal Engine, but you need a really high powerful graphic card. So if you have a, a, a desktop for games, that will be a good computer to do all this. Because you need a lot of RAM memory. Right. And how do you think uh, the learning curve of this software and what is your uh, tips for us if you want to try it out? I think now it's easier because you can actually download a lot of templates and then you can just modify from there. You don't need to actually build your own from scratch. Yeah, so, yeah. so that helps also for rigs and stuff. So, but you need to spend a bit of money like, course you need to to pay to get a membership then you can download but i think it's a worthwhile investment but to learn it uh it does take time especially if you're into animation or rigging which is the, the worst modeling itself is quite easy texturing is is uh you know quite intuitive as well you just experiment with it but i think if you you know nothing from from sort of knowing nothing do you want to be expert? Maybe a whole year should be enough, but you need the proper, proper hardware. I think in order to experience it fully, that, that is a major stumbling block. But to understand it is quite easy now because uh, you can take a class, there's also tutorials, but I think most of them, they, as cause they, they are from the ICAT, they're from the design school, so they are doing this. But, uh, but actually, you can learn a lot from tutorials as well. And there are also websites like GitHub, where you can download code. So coding is also quite an important thing for animation now, especially on WebGL or, or even 3D, you know, where you can also create textures and things like that, different sort of behaviors for animation. But I think for 3D, uh, I think Maya would be good. Maya, Blender. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 3D Max as well. So these are free also softwares. But Maya, you have to pay. <laughs> but as a student, I think you get free licenses for a year at least. So you should keep your... Uh, student ID. <laughs> I, I hope others understand that. And I have one more question is about, you, you talk, uh, because many of your project is using WebGL. Yeah. And how does the coding, that, is it you use mostly is coding or is like have an interface for you to mod, do modeling? Uh, we have to create the interface. So mostly this is done by my, my web developer. I work with him. I'm mostly more of the, uh, the visual, the visualizer. So it is a lot of, he might find it quite hard to work with me because I'm, I'm always changing my mind. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it involves coding and if you want to do amazing things, it's really about the code. How well, how well, or how much you know about the code. That's why a, web, a website like GitHub is where you can also get open source plugins, free. They share codes that you can just copy and paste and put inside. But you obviously obviously have to know how the WebGL architecture works. Uh, meaning how uh, how the content is is stored and and, and then how the code will affect. You know, but a lot of things are plugged in now. So I think it's very easy. It's easier, I think, than from when I was a student, when we talk about web and creating 3D, it's like, well, no, only pro, pros can do it, you know. But nowadays, there are plenty of people sharing it. 
So I think uh, this help. You can check out this website. It's where you can get open source coding and where people share like, all their experiments. So you can see so what are the possibilities. And uh, you can, I think best if you want to start working on this, you, you work with, with a web designer or web developer or someone who is also studying that. And then you guys can both discover more things because you need someone who knows code for sure. <laughs> it's all coding. But in terms of the, the 3D elements, you can model it yourself, you know, and then you, but you have to bring it in in certain formats. So, so GLTF and GLB formats works the best. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all for the questions. And once again, thank you very much, Mr. James. And thank okay. you all for joining us for today's online lecture. We all right. hope all. Uh, hope you all enjoy it. So stay safe, stay healthy, and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Marizon, you want yes. to end the meeting now or you want to? I, I end the meeting now. Yeah.